major urine testing laboratory, we specialize in pain management, and we exclusively utilize LCMS and MASS to test the urines we receive. Um, we have a rapid turnaround time in our laboratory, about 48 hours, and we're screening all the samples with LCMS and MASS, so we're really interested in throughput. So I thought I would start with a history of urine drug testing. Urine drug testing was established several decades ago, and it was really targeted towards um, employees who fell under the jurisdiction of transportation. So prior to the implementation of a federally regulated program to drug screen truck drivers, there was about 18% of truck drivers who were positive for amphetamines, cocaine, and marijuana. So the program was really targeted towards measuring these drugs and a couple other drugs of abuse, the Nida-5. Um, and it was based on the technology at the time, which was immunoassay and gas chromatography. So gas chromatography is somewhat labor intensive. It requires um, derivatization, sample extraction, uh, a skilled laboratory scientist. And so the model was set up to screen by immunoassay and then only confirm those samples which came back positive with GCMS. So to give you an idea of what type of cutoff you're going to achieve with an immunoassay, um, here's an opiate immunoassay cutoff. And really, if you look at um, what concentrations it screens for, it's really targeted towards morphine. Um, hydromorphone, it's not very specific, and, and, and oxycodone, it's also not very specific, which is why they ended up developing an independent immunoassay for oxycodone. So now I want to move into really when we're doing drug monitoring for pain management, what's really different about this. So if we examine what the goals are for pain management testing, we see that this traditional forensic testing model is not going to apply so well to what we want to do in pain management. So for pain management, um, really what we want to do is we want to extend the test menu to identify 99% or more of possibly abused drugs. Uh, so that's the opiates, opioids, benzodiazepines, illicits, antidepressants, et cetera. Um, and then, so what we're interested in informing the physicians about is not only addiction, but illicit drug use, um, alcohol use, doctor shopping where the patient is going around to different doctors to get multiple prescriptions, and diversion where the patient is getting a prescription not for their own use, but possibly to sell it for profit or give it to somebody else. So um, the, other, the other difference is that we need to be able to confirm the presence of multiple drugs and metabolites in each sample. So in a traditional forensic lab, you might see one sample out of 100 screening positive, whereas now in pain management, the average urine sample is going to be positive for four to five medications. And so if we think about this and compare this to the type of throughput you're going to get with a typical immunoassay, you have an Olympus instrument, it can do 10,000 tests a day. And now what we want to do in order to reach all these goals is we want to screen every single sample with LCMSMS. And so the real hurdle to doing that comes in throughput. How are we going to compete with that type of throughput on the LCMSMS? And so the way we start is with the simplest sample prep possible. We're screening urine samples, so we're doing a simple dilute and shoot where we just take the urine and we uh, dilute it with deuterated internal standards. You can also um, process it with glucuronidase where you're going to cleave off the sugar. That's an optional step. There's pros and cons to doing it either way. But you can see, for example, morphine, if you don't hydrolyze it before you analyze it, you're going to have to analyze the 6-beta-glucuronide and the 3-beta-glucuronide and the free. Or you can just add an ex a little bit extra pre-processing time and now you only have to worry about the free. So, in addition to simple sample prep, we need the fastest mass spec method that we can run. And so the way we're achieving that is with the multiplexing platform. So this is an example of the Transcend LX4 system where we have the ARIA multiplexing LC on the front and we're using the TSQ quantum ultra triple quad as our detector. So what this is is now we have four pumps, we have four channels, and we're basically going to offset our LC runs so that we're going to maximize the efficiency of our detector. And really the beauty of this is you don't have to wait for your sample to elute. You don't have to wait while you're washing out and re-equilibrating your column. And you can get pretty fast run times. So this is an example of um, a 40-second 
runtime that we achieved using the multiplexing. So to give you a specific example, here's um, carboxy THC. This is the metabolite of the active ingredient in marijuana. And we've achieved a 37 cycle, second cycle time for this. So 37, you're spending now 37 seconds per sample. Uh, and so what that translates to is actually your LC runtime now is two and a half, has to be two and a half minutes in order for each channel to be 37 seconds. And the way we do this is with a short column, we're using 50 millimeter column, and we're using a relatively high flow rate of one milliminute. Basically, load the sample on, elute it off as quickly as possible, and then re-equilibrate for the next injection. So now we're running at high flow rates. We're basic, we're employing the HESI source. Um, we're also selecting the transitions which are the most selective versus the most abundant. We can, and so we're achieving here now four orders of linear dynamic range where the bottom end of this curve is 15 nanograms per mil. And this actually becomes really useful in pain management because now you're quantitating over four orders. You can develop reference intervals and you can really identify those patients that are on the upper end of the excretion curve versus the mid versus the low. Um, so here's an example of we're getting really good sensitivity. So this is an example of an MRM uh, chromatogram at 15 femtomoles for the carboxy THC. And you can, so this is at 15 nanograms per mil, the lowest end. And you can see that we're having absolutely no problems at all with sensitivity here. We could go much, much lower if we needed to. So now we, we're not exactly at the level of, of Olympus and how fast we can screen, but we're doing pretty good. So we buy several mass spectrometers and now we're gonna screen every sample with LCMSMS to see what comes out. And so this is a survey of our data where we took about 8,000 urines and we screened them with amino acid and then we took those same urines and we screened them with LCMSMS and here's a comparison of what you would detect. And so here in this table we're just comparing um, comparing what we observed with SAMHSA cutoffs versus our in-house in LCMS cutoffs. So over here on the blue, you see for amphetamines, the SAMHSA cutoff would be um, 1,000, and now our LCMS cutoff is 100, and so you can see, and then over here in the red is basically what we determined we missed when we were using that model of screening with the amino assay and only confirming the positives. And so for several of these, like for example, benzodiazepines, um, you can see that it's an example of how the immunoassay is not very specific at all for clonazepam, where we would have missed 76% of the positives for that drug. Another good example is cocaine, where now when we decrease the cutoff from 300 to 25, we're detecting 42% more people who are using cocaine. And then hydromorphone is another big one, where now we would have missed 69% of the urines, positive urines, had we not screened them for mass spec up front. And so this was, these, these results were actually published in um, several papers um, from our laboratory. So in terms of compliance, I'm not sure what happened there, but in terms of compliance, if we um, look at what we would be reporting as a non-compliance if you're only using the amino assay to screen and then confirming by mass spec, you're gonna be reporting a compliance rate as high as 75% reported. Um, so now when we're screening everything by mass spec, we see that compliance is actually drug specific, but the rates of non-compliance are much, much lower than you would, have, you would have observed with immuno assay. So we're seeing a definite bias there with the amino assay due to the cutoffs and the non-specificity. So now I, I just wanna give another example of where um, we're not getting the specificity that we need. So uh, the federal guideline used to state that you would test for 6-acetyl morphine only when morphine was greater than or equal to 2,000 nanograms per mil. So this was basically set up so that you could use an amino acid to screen for morphine, and then only if morphine was positive would you have to confirm with the mass spec if 6-acetyl morphine was there. So 6-acetyl morphine is a metabolite of heroin so after um, heroin, heroin has a half-life, a very short half-life. It quickly hydrolyzes to 6 a.m., which is also assumed to have a very short half-life, which then further hydrolyzes to morphine, and this is expected to be the major excretion metabolite. So 
based on this understanding of the metabolism of heroin, this seems like a pretty relevant guideline. So what we did was we quantitated morphine and success teal morphine in a little over 20,000 urines. Um, what we found was that 33% of the urine samples, which were positive for success teal morphine, showed little or, or very low levels of morphine where you would have never caught that based on the amino assay. And so this, we weren't the first people to observe that this, that success teal morphine does not always show a high morphine level. And we actually published these observations last year, and since then the um, federal guideline has changed, and now you're required to screen for success till morphine up front on the amino assay. So the next, the next um, example I wanted to talk about was for the detection of alcohol use. So alcohol use is really important in pain management because it's, it doesn't mix with most of the prescriptions that, these, that, that, that are being prescribed. So we wanted to have a sensitive marker for alcohol use. That's ethylglucuronide and ethyl sulfate. Um, these are sensitive markers because they're excreted in the urine for much, much longer than ethanol. Ethanol is only excreted for up to 12 hours, where ethylglucuronide and ethyl sulfate can be excreted for days. So you can have a much more sensitive biomarker of whether your patient is using alcohol. So we developed a multiplexing analysis, LCMS analysis for ETG and ETS. Um, we were able to achieve a one-minute cycle time and get really good separation. These are very polar metabolites, so this was kind of a challenging assay for us. And so this is, um, we measured a little over 4,000 urines. We measured them using the ETG amino assay, which only detects ETG, not ETS. Um, and then we confirmed all the urines with, ET, with our LCMS method. What we saw was that the amino assay performs relatively well except for it actually has a pretty high false positive rate in this patient population, so it's necessary to test all of those samples by LCMS. Um, so if we want to compare that to ethanol, if you only testing with ethanol, we would have seen less than 1% of our, caught 1% of the patients um, as using alcohol. So the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism estimates that around 8.5 to 15% of the population has an alcohol dependency, dependency issue. So you really need to be detecting ETG and ETS if you want to detect, you know, you really want a, a good marker for whether or not um, the patient is consuming alcohol. So now um, we wanted to correlate ethanol to ETG and ETS, and so the question became, does a positive urinary ethanol concentration reflect recent alcohol ingestion? This is somewhat of a trick question. So we screened 10,000 urines for ethanol, and our ethanol test is an enzymatic, enzymatic test. And then we also tested all of those 10,000 urines for ETG and ETS. Um, we found 94 urines positive for ethanol, uh, and 34% of those were negative for ETG and ETS. So the problem with determining only looking at an ethanol concentration is that if you have a patient who has glucose in their urine, such as a diabetic, then the glucose can undergo fermentation in transit, and you can get a false positive ethanol when the patient really hasn't consumed. So we, our toxicologists actually would get calls from doctors who are wondering, oh, well, my patient is diabetic, and they claim they're not drinking alcohol. Can you determine if they really are or not? So one approach would be that you could measure the glucose in the urine and see if they had a high glucose level, then possibly the ethanol is coming from fermentation. So that's what we did. We measured the glucose levels in the urine, and we also looked at what the ethanol concentrations were. So we saw that 13% of these urines that were positive for ethanol had non-physiologic concentrations. So that would, that would point towards fermentation was really occurring. So here's an example of where we compared what the glucose levels are for all the ethanol positives, whether they have ETG and ETS present or whether ETG and ETS are not present. And what we found is that you really cannot use glucose to determine whether the ethanol is from fermentation. Uh, we saw glucose in the samples that had ETG and ETS, and we saw samples that were ETG, ETS negative, have no glucose. And really our explanation of that was that we were getting complete um, fermentation of the glucose into ethanol, and so you really can't use that to determine whether or not it's caused through fermentation. 
and you have to have the ETG and the ETS to distinguish the production of ethanol from fermentation in these urines. So I just want to summarize that um, we're screening every single sample from LC, for LCMSMS, and we're finding that's really providing comprehensive information for us. Um, it's also increasing the specificity of, and so it's allowing us to extend the test menu for prescribed med medications and hopefully up to greater than 99% of the possibly abused drugs. And so what I think is that the multiplexing system, I don't need to say that mass spec is sensitive and selective. It really comes down to now a speed and a cost issue. Can you use mass spec as efficiently as you can use the amino assay? And I think that we're really getting to the point where with the transcend that we can actually start to compete with the speed of the amino assay and on top of that get the really good data. So I just want to say that our future work is that we're trying to improve the speed even more. I think that we definitely have a lot of room to move there even now that we're at a 37 second cycle time. And then also we want to add the addition of the ultra high resolution where it was mentioned earlier that you are, even when you're using, doing the targeted analysis of the triple quad, you're still biasing your information. So if we can add the ultra high resolution and do a non-targeted search, then that will definitely improve. And just my acknowledgements, I want to acknowledge my colleagues at Millennium Laboratories, um, Amadeo Pesci and Robert West, the laboratory directors, our chief scientific officers, and our scientific team. Um, also, Pat Friel, he uh, collaborated with us on the 6 acetyl morphine, and he visits our lab quite frequently to help us out. And then also, um, the scientists at Thermal Fisher, Dr. Marta Kozak and James Bird, who helped us develop our throughput and um, integrate the transcend into our operations.